Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Week That Really Was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan. For this week, ending the 25th of October, 2024, it is almost Halloween. The leaves are falling from the trees, and we are going to begin with an apology to all our regular listeners and viewer viewers who had to suffer through the fact that last week's episode was inexplicably late, and we're sorry for that. Sarah and I recorded it in time, but then Fatima and I went to London for the Battle of Ideas, and we left other people in charge, and look what happened. Um, that, in short, is the problem. I'm teasing. Uh, we had some technical issues. We basically <laughs> had back-end issues with Grip last weekend that caused some problems, and the fact that I was absent probably didn't help. So thank you to those of you who I know look out for this podcast every Friday afternoon. Um, we're very sorry about that, and it will not repeat. And Ignore I said that if you're somehow listening to this on Sunday afternoon wondering where I've been for the last two days, but I hope that hasn't happened uh, this week. <laughs> Sarah, how are you? I'm good, yeah. The, lots of people were messaging us because apparently a lot of people use this podcast as their kind of thing to listen to to clean. So there was not a house mopped, not a floor mopped in, in Ireland last Friday. Sorry about that. Oh, golly. Well, I was in London. I wasn't around for all that. So you got the worst of it. I was over there with Fatima, as I said, at the Battle of Ideas. And I just want to say for the record, she was phenomenal. And when her speech goes up, as I'm sure they'll put it up on their website in a couple of weeks, I recommend that you all watch it. I was pretty good too, but it's, it's kind of bad form to say that. And anyway, you can probably all disagree <laughs> with me. Um, Sarah, I have one more apology to make before we get into it, which was that last week we said at the very start of the podcast, we'd talk about Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. And then we just didn't. We just forgot because we, we had so much else to talk about. So we'll get into that later on this week. Uh, but let's start with the general election, because I do remember saying last week that, you know, by the time we, you hear from us again, the general election will have been called. Well, that's not true, but we do, now do know the date, November 29th. Are you excited? Yeah. Is that official? Is that official official? Or is that just a, a kind of a date we're coming up with based on the fact that there can't be many other dates apart from that? Well, it's been so widely leaked and briefed and, you know, the, you know yeah. poor old John Lee in the Daily Mail. I was convinced enough to put it on the front page of the mail. So, I mean, John, if you're watching, you're going to look like an idiot if you have that one wrong. I presume you know <laughs> you're going to look like an idiot if that one wrong. So I'm going to take John Lee's word for it in the Daily Mail because I think he's got pretty good sources. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's going to be. It makes sense. And it also makes sense in another respect, Sarah, which is that, that you know, they're going to call the election party on November the 6th and have, an, have the election. 23 days just over three day, three weeks later which is a very short campaign which i think makes sense if you're simon harris right because he thinks he's winning yeah yeah i think um, he is too mm. um yeah i mean look it's not it's 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 a good month for them to have it all the social welfare payments are coming out um you know i think fina gale are going to have a really really good election i mean people can get mad at me for saying it it's not what i necessarily would want to happen but i think that that's the logical outcome so why would he not go fast and then end all the conversations about election and get on with his the business of you know the important um agenda of the government like putting men into women's prisons and stuff like that so they can get on with that in the new year um i think uh, uh yeah like it's also just become really boring talking and speculating about it so hopefully that's it now and we just have an election a fast so election boring. and so boring um so yeah and get down to the business of you know who who who's getting elected and who's not getting elected and making our predictions and you know actually seeing you know what this campaign becomes about because like i've said you know loads of times before you know events might arise the campaign kind of changes tack but with everything that's ha been happening with Sinn Féin and the timing and the social welfare payments coming out i think it just became obvious that it would be absolutely insane not to call a general election before december Time is running out, though, for events, dear boy events. I mean, time really is yeah, running out. True. I mean, we're talking about a month and five days away. You know, at this point, mm -hmm. this, we're recording this on the 24th of October. We're talking about an election on the 29th of November. There's, what, four weeks left? That Four and a bit weeks mm -hmm. left? That is um, that is uh, maybe five weeks, actually, if I do my sums right. Five weeks between now and the election. That's a very short time for the game to change in any meaningful way. I mean, you could have some things could happen. I mean, like, you know, we could find out who the politician is who beat up her sister. Um, that was a fascinating story. I thought at the weekend, uh, a, a political figure, not as it said, a sitting politician, a political figure, who is being investigated for the guard by the guardie for beating up her sister. I mean, whoever that is, that family must be hurting. Um, mm. and I mean, you know, it's it's it, it's sad, really, isn't it? Well, sounds awful, doesn't it? Well, it does. I, I mean, uh, what could you say, John? What could you say? This is. For the benefit of the doubt, for the viewers and listeners, and we shouldn't do this, this is one of those times where Sarah and I both know who we're talking about, but unfortunately we can't tell you 
because we might get sued. Um, but hopefully mm. that will all become apparent uh, in time and Sarah and I won't be left singing for our supper. Um, like choir boys. Anyway, um, coming back to the, to, the, to the general election and the date and all that sort of stuff. Um, I was going through, and people who read Griffin know I've been going through the constituencies one by one, and there's a couple of storylines there that I think are important. And I'm looking at two party leaders in particular, and I want to get your thoughts on their seats. First one is Holly Kearns. I was going through her constituency today, and I was thinking, if I was a Social Democrat, I would be very nervous about my leader. <sighs> Dare to dream. No, um... Yeah, That's what I mean, sir. I mean, like, well, well, I mean, no, I don't want like a look. I, there's, there's on my, on my, on my seat losing bingo card. Holly Kearns wouldn't be, wouldn't be high on it. I, I, I'm kind of indifferent to that particular one, and um, yeah. So I don't know the constituency well enough, but I've heard this before. Talk me through it. How many seats? So it's Cork South West. There are three seats. Uh, Michael Collins of Independent Ireland, the leader there, got more than quoted the last time. He topped the poll. Yeah. He got 25% of the vote and romped in on the first count. Then you'll remember at the last election, there was this whole thing where uh, Christopher O'Sullivan, the sitting Fianna Fáil TD, was actually in a relationship with Holly Kearns, the then new- newcoming Social Democrat TD. Um, uh, mm-hmm. That relationship, uh, and I don't say this to be any way prurient, it's just a statement of fact that that relationship is no longer ongoing. So those were the three who got elected. But the thing was, Sarah, Fine Gael had held a seat in that constituency basically since the beginning of time, and they suddenly lost it in a bit of a fluke the last time. And they're gunning for it back. And I just mm-hmm. don't see who else they're going to take it off of Holly Kearns, because she only got 10% of the vote the last time. She got in on Sinn Féin transfers, um, and Fine Gael presumably may have learned their lesson a little teeny bit. But do you not think that that's a seat then that could be potentially also vulnerable for Fianna Fáil? Uh, it, it could be, but Fianna Fáil's vote the last time was so much higher. Fianna Fáil had a quota between them. They ran two candidates. They ran right. um, Christopher Sullivan and they ran Margaret Murphy O'Mahony or O'Mahony Murphy or she's two names anyway, God love her. O'Mahony uh, Murphy. She was, she, was the t- she was the TD and she lost to him then. What's that it? She, she, got, she got gazumped entirely by her younger uh, male running mate in a, compl- right. in a complete and... Co- uh, comprehensive blow against feminism and i wonder whether cork south west might deliver another comprehensive blow to the feminist case by replacing liberal holly kearns with uh with uh, somebody like god love him tim lombard from Fine Gael. that would just be i mean if that does happen make sure and tune on rte and watch the faces drop drop and droop uh because they'd be well, very Fine Gael are just that. as liberal as them anyway but yeah yeah that's definitely i mean there's always surprises um and I think that when people like I I don't know the constituency on the ground. So, you'd you know, you'd have to like ask yourself, has Holly Kearns been absolutely working on the ground like nobody's business the entire doll term or not? And she is pregnant at the moment, as far as I know, isn't she? So um, Mm -hmm. I think she is. Um, So, you know, she might she might not be up for cam I don't know like she might not be up for canvassing as much so you'd have to say all the all those things combined definitely put her in the mix for a question yeah and the other thing is, of course as a party leader you can't spend as much time on the ground you've got to be touring around the country backing your other candidates so that becomes complicated it becomes a complication for the social democrats because they might not have her on the ground if she's to fight to save her own seat in Cork Southwest the other one is another one I'm going to say because this other person is going to have to spend her her time going around the country campaigning for other candidates and her seat, I think, just got a whole lot less safe because Claire Daly announced today, Sarah, that she was going to jump in the race in Dublin Central, where Mary Lou Macdonald, the leader of Sinn Féin, holds her seat. Is she safe? No. I, I Like, I think she'll probably hold on, but I think that there's a lot of people eating her dinner there. There's Malachy Steenson. Um, there's now Claire Daly. There's a history of electing an independent in that constituency. Um, now... I'd question about whether Mary Lou will be doing as much of a tour of the country as maybe other party leaders, because I'd say her da- her brand at the moment is probably not ideal uh, if you're mm-hmm. a local Sinn Féin TD and you probably want to be more focusing on your local work than the leader's uh, performance over the last while. But Mary Lou has, you know, not gotten elected in that constituency before. And, you know, like Pascal is definitely a safe seat there. You'd imagine that Gary Gannon is too. Um, mm-hmm. So... You know, 
while I think Mary Lou will probably get elected, I think she'll be sitting around for multiple, multiple counts and it'll be a bit humiliating as a party leader, the main opposition leader, uh, if that happens. Well, everyone knows from the last election that if you get elected on anything other than the first count is not legitimate. That's what people yeah. were saying. And uh, I think it'll be kind of funny to see some of those people have to flip themselves. And I don't say that in any kind of mean way. I think it just it just will be. Anyway, look, Sarah and I will get into the election in a lot of detail in kind of really we're going to nerd it out entirely as the election gets closer and it's called. We're going to look at these constituencies and look at all the kind of transfer patterns and all that really boring stuff. And those of you who aren't interested in it can go and, like, I don't know, watch Love Island or something. Um, that's actually interesting while we do that. Um, so we'll park it for now. The big story of the week, um, and this is where we're going to get a little bit more serious, um, is the case of Kyron Dern, Sarah, up in mm. Dundalk, the, the child who was reported missing in August, um, I think August 28th. And then last week, the Guardian announced that they have come to the conclusion that he may have been, he may some he's come to some harm, he may be dead, and he may have been dead for some time. Indeed, I saw one report saying he may have been dead for two years. Now, they're searching a house in Dundalk for his body, um, or presumably for, I, I, that's not true. I'm going to take that back. They're searching a house in Dundalk in connection with his disappearance. We don't know what they're searching for, but like a logic would lead you to believe that it's probably for human remains. Um, what's your reaction to that story? My reaction to this story is, you know, we talked about it before, which is that we seem to have a government who are incapable of acknowledging that there are massive, massive problems with Tusla and and the way that, you know, some children are managed by the state when they're in difficulty. There was a, a, a case this week or I saw Ben asking Roger O'Gorman about, it, uh, you know, this case that was in the news recently about the girl who was disappeared from care and ended up with being found in a brothel. She was, what, mm -hmm. 14, was she? 14. Um, and... And and while, you know, I, I, on some level, I appreciate that, you know, it's extremely difficult to manage. You know, there are a lot of children who come to the attention of, of Tusa and, you know, there are children who are come from horrific situations. And, you know, some children, you know, it, it happens in the UK as well. They slip through the net for whatever reason. I think that the lack of real acknowledgement that something has gone horribly wrong here and that this potentially needs to be looked at. And all we're hearing about is two stars saying that they're going to, you know, look into how this was managed when a child is still missing is a bit of a worry. I, I, I think it's more than that. I think it's worse than that. Um, I mean, I want to, before I say what I say, I, I want to say this is not about that particular case. Like, you know, because... Mm. It's it's unfair to the family and everyone concerned to talk about that particular case, particularly when we don't know what happened. We do know what happened with the 14-year-old. It was actually in March, the 14-year-old girl who was in the care of TUSA, the care of the state agency responsible for, it's called the Child and Family Agency. They're supposed to protect children and families in difficult situations. And a 14-year-old child, child disappeared from their care and was later found in a brothel where presumably people were having sex with the child, presumably. Um, and if that had happened under the care of an order of nuns, it would be the biggest story in the country for years. There would be films made about it. There would be documentaries made about it. There would be the equivalent of the Magdalene Laundries made about it. And unless anyone think I'm, I'm saying, Sarah, any of this to absolve any of that shit that went on in the country. Yeah, I'm I not. Um, but some people will, will think I am. I'm not. Oh, um, yeah. I'm wait, wait, it's obvious I'm, you're not. You're, it's, it's obvious you're not. So, um, um, But, but I, I don't understand how in a case like that nobody seems to care. Um and it, it sometimes seems to me that, you know, liberal Ireland is as guilty as what Catholic Ireland was guilty of. So Catholic Ireland did this thing where it said, well, we have the mother and baby homes and we put the mothers and babies in there and the church looks after them and we turn a blind eye to it. And liberal Ireland has kind of said, well, we don't want the church. The church can't be trusted. So we've Tusla. And we put the kids in there and Tusla looks after them and we turn a blind eye to it. And um, that's the only explanation I can come up with because... Here's the thing that happened. We know what happened. It was reported upon. Here's another case where a child hasn't been looked after for two years. And where's the public reaction? It's kind of like, oh, you know, uh, tough shit. 
I mean, uh, Roderick Gorman's answer to Ben, I thought, if you haven't seen that video, it's on the grip feed where he basically said, well, look, Ben asked Tusla and Ben said to him, but you're, you're in charge of Tusla. And Roderick Gorman essentially shrugs as if kind of like, well, nothing to do with me, Gov. Mm. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't want to go shouting and ranting and raving for the sake of it, Sarah, because that doesn't solve anything. But it's astonishing to me that, that you know we live in a country where people are choosing to put up with this stuff, in part because the media aren't covering it. But you can't blame the media for everything. But you know, for me, it comes back to, to the to a sort of a, a hierarchy of priorities, and you know my 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 main gripe with the government in general would come under that umbrella which is that you know there are things in Ireland that are working very well and then there are things in Ireland that aren't working very well and it it seems to me that the government seems to be fixating on things that are neither going well nor not going well but are no one asked for no one wanted and that's their priority like hate speech bills and you know pumping nonsense to children's edu- education etc etc not to harp on about that kind of thing but instead like you know that that there is there are some issues with some of our fundamentals be they be they um the way how we manage ch- vulnerable children ch- children who are in danger or children who are vulnerable be it how we manage um the how the LPW is given money to do, you know, certain infrastructure projects. And there are problems with those. And instead of them being addressed, the government is kind of doing things over here, like, look over here, look over, look over here. We're doing this like hate speech bill that no one asked for. And so ultimately it comes down to priorities. And and we know that the government, when it suits them, can do things fast, can fix things fast, because we saw that in COVID. Things, large scale change can be mobilized overnight when it suits. So, you know, why like certain problems are continuously allowed to arise. I don't know. And it can only be about priorities. Roger Gorman doesn't seem to be that concerned or urgent about, you know, how Tusla is managing aspects relating to child safety, but he is very concerned about other nonsense that, you know, no one asked for. And that to me is a kind of a, a, it's like a microcosm of a larger scale problem that the government have, which is ultimately what I would describe as priorities. Well, we have another example this week of Roderick O'Gorman's management, because my colleague Matt Tracy did this report, I don't know if you saw it, you probably didn't, um, on a hotel in Port Arlington, where, I mean, to cut a long story short, the people who own the hotel um, have this contract, they've been paid millions and millions to accommodate asylum seekers, and they had basically taken over a couple of private houses in the town, and literally shunted 16 people into a single house and boarded up the windows with, with, um, with bunk beds, and had overcrowded these homes, and we brought it to IPAS's attention that they wouldn't comment. And we brought it to the minister's attention. He wouldn't comment. And now we hear this. Now we hear like at the end of the week that they've cancelled the contract for the hotel. But I mean, this is a guy who's responsible for refugees. And I don't care what your view on immigration is, Sarah. He's treating refugees like cattle. Like, like mm. there, are, there, are, there, are, there are cowboys in the country who are literally opening any old jalopy of a shed, going to the government and saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll take some international protection applicants. These people are shunted down into the middle of God knows where. Uh, treated like cash cows for, for, for uh, let's call it a spade a spade. In many cases, not in all cases, in many cases, cowboy businessmen out for a quick buck. And the government calls it calls it compassion and the public are kind of like, oh, well, maybe that's not as bad as it was a couple of months ago. I mean, you'd want to put your head through a wall sometimes doing this job, honestly. I know. I know. Um, would. And and no accountability. And, and, and also, like, you know, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind and touch wood, I'm wrong. But ultimately, when you start packing people into, you know, there will be eventually be some kind of safety. There'll be a fire. There'll be something. Some horrendous thing will happen because those places are not up to code. They're not mm-hmm. fire regulated. You know, they're it's it's an accident waiting to happen. And, you, and I say- you know, people will hopefully not lose their lives because they were, you know, unfortunate enough to be lumped into a 16 better in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. that nobody gave a shite about. Yeah. You, know? you and I said, in fairness, during the when, when, when there was a real bite and anger to the protests about immigration, roughly around about this time last year, maybe through to February of this year, and there were buildings set on fire. I remember we said on this podcast, look, you've got to stop doing this or somebody will be killed. Well, it's the mm-hmm. same situation. If you keep piling people into unsuitable accommodation there will be a fire and somebody be killed and then it'll be oh spilt milk no one saw this coming well if that happens i'm sorry i'm gonna say i told you so 
But I'm not even talking about arson. I'm just talking about an accident. Anything. Oh, I, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You're not. I know you're not talking. But I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying what we said about arson is also true of this. It's also true that if you mm. keep piling people into these houses, somebody's going to overload a plug. A toaster is going to go on fire. Something's going to happen. You know, um, the fire safety regulations exist for a reason. Is all I am saying. Yep. Hmm. Anyway, um, will we? We talk a little bit about sex education again. Must we? Yeah, go on. You did a great rant about it there last week, a couple of two weeks ago. It went super viral. People were like, "Yeah, you go, Sarah." Nice out here. Oh, because I cause said cause that if you about... wanted, because if you wanted, because I said that if you want to teach kids about rimming and fisting, you're a pervert. Yeah, that one. That one. That's um, a hill. Well, that's a hill I'll die on, John. That's a hill I'll die on. Well, the government have basically been saying. Sarah, Sarah Ryan, that you are wrong. We haven't been teaching mm. ki- kids about ribbing and fisting at all. That's all misinformation. It's misrepresentation. Uh, the Journal ran an article um, this week which said, complete misrepresentation didn't happen. RTE um, had Emar, e- sorry, what's her name? O- uh, I think it's Emar O'Kelly. Her second name is definitely O'Kelly. Their education correspondent uh, do a whole piece about how poor DCU academics are being attacked and threatened because of all this misinformation going around that nobody wanted to teach their kids about rimming and fisting. And all the time we had a recording from the uh, course which we published. It's on Grip Media. You can go and listen to teachers on the course talking to lecturers about how kids in their class were hate when that happens about rimming and fisting. Uh, it doesn't hate matter. Does it? I mean, because it's not as if or the Irish Times are going to pick it up. It seems to me with this story that the establishment has basically decided that they're just going to say it never happened, regardless of what episode you, uh, evidence you put in front of them didn't happen. Um, we're going to keep saying it didn't happen and you're misinterpreting everything and even if you have them in the classroom showing them a literal porn video about fisting on Pornhub it didn't happen you imagined it now for clarity no one did that but I'm saying that even if even if you had that the government's position would still be didn't happen um, yeah. why do you think that is? Well, I mean because they know that ultimately the the truth and like the 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 reality of it isn't palatable to most people in Ireland, that they don't have support for that kind of thing. That they, I mean, uh, I mean, we can we've we can make our in- assessments about why we think this is happening, but like let's just supposing that the government just lacks the testicular fortitude to stand up against NGOs who want to push this stuff into schools. They don't want to mm-hmm. be exposed for that, so they just act like it's not happening. Um, but you know, the thing is that like. I don't think when you're walking down the street that save for a paedophile that there's many people that you will meet who will be interested in teaching children that kind of stuff. Like the, yeah. no normal, no normal adult, no normal thinking person thinks that fisting and rimming should be taught to people in school. No one does. I, 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 I like, I mean, I, I, that's a, that's a, like I said, that's a hill I'll die on. Nobody who's normal, nobody who, I was going to say nobody who has children, even people who don't have children, nobody who is a normal, like functioning adult thinks that that's a good idea. And they know that they know that if it's exposed, if it's put on, you know, if you print it out exactly what it is and it was given to the public, they won't like it and they won't support it. So they just pretend like it's not happening. I mean, there's a couple of things to say here. First of all, the original video, Mary Creedon is the woman in question who uh, who was the, the whistleblower in the first The original video, not with Gripped, with uh, with the Natural Women's Council, um, who are a campaigning mm. group, has, has over 750,000 views. So it hit a nerve with people. People were yeah. sharing it around and they were watching it. But we, no one's ever really gotten to the bigger question, Sarah, which is why do they want this stuff taught? Now, I'm going to say something controversial. You can tell me whether I'm pushing the envelope too far or not. My theory on all of this, uh, I'm going to say something that I don't think you could say in Ireland for a long time, and maybe you still shouldn't say, and maybe I'll get cancelled. Oh, I'm scared. I'm scared. Go on. Um, So I think that a lot of this stuff um, is about legitimizing the sexual preferences of a particular demographic. Um, So I think a lot of this is about normalizing uh, gay male sex. Like, I think a lot of this is about, um, you know, we want there to be no homophobia. So we want to talk about particular sexual practices, which are often the preserve, apparently, of gay men. Um, and we want to normalize them and say this is this is completely normal stuff that everyone does. Stuff like um, 
the aforementioned practices, particularly particularly yeah. rimming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, uh, and I think it's there's there's, a, there's an agenda here which says. For years ago, years for example, anal sex is on the on the course. And anal sex has always been associated; it's not exclusively, but it's always been associated with with, with gay male uh, sexuality. Um, and now it's being taught in in classes to heterosexual to to boys and girls of all sexualities and none. Um, I, I ask myself, why is that? And I don't think it is because fourteen year olds are generally taken with anal sex. I think it is because there is a huge push to say that. You know, all kinds of sex are equally legitimate. And nobody should be shamed for anything. And I think that all comes from the campaign to stop so-called homophobia. Um, and I think that's what the push is. I don't think it's actually about educating kids. I think it's about indoctrinating them into a particular worldview. Um, when it comes to, you know, you, 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 you can't judge anything and you can't be repelled by anything because all this stuff is normal. Am I, have I cancelled myself or have I said anything that's even half reasonable? I mean, I think if you're going to be cancelled, you would have been cancelled long ago, John. Mm, but uh, you're way past the point of cancelability, uh, cancelability, whatever. Um, I don't know. I like. I, I think that there are a lot, a lot of gay people, including some I know, that would be absolutely opposed to this being taught. So I think completely that, agree. Completely agree. Not saying anything. I think that. Sorry. I think that the the. You know, like even if you go the ways and say, okay, like, and I, and 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 to, for the most part, I do that. Like, what consenting adults want to do with each other in their own private homes or whatever is really none of my business, and I don't care. Um, so it's like, it's the, it's what you what you're saying. I can I like what you're saying. If you wanted, if you were, if you had an agenda that you wanted society to just agree and. And, um, you know, normalize whatever you were doing, like to a point I can go along with that. But this isn't that because this is kids. Do you know what I mean? Like, like supposing like, you know, Ireland became less conservative when it came to lots of sexual things that let's just say straight people were doing. But there was never a push to to normalize that in schools. Just, no. you know, people became more sexually liberal in Ireland. People would talk about different things more openly. People became more sexually pr promiscuous as adults. People had much more different partners. People just started to do more sexual stuff, right? So definitely there was a whole, like liberals wanted to normalize the expanding range of sexual acts that straight couples were doing. But they never wanted to teach it to kids. So, yeah. well, 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 if you're a homosexual, consenting homosexual male adult, you know what I mean? Maybe you want people to understand that you do things with your partner or whatever and you want to normalize it. And that's fine. And I think that there's lots of gay men that that's a perfectly legitimate thing for them want, to want to do. It's the children part that it gets weird. It's the, yeah, but let's the like, like why, why no one was ever trying to teach more liberal sexual views for straight people to kids so yeah let, 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 let let's to be clear what i'm saying i'm not saying that there's a gay conspiracy to corrupt kids or anything like that what i'm no, saying i know is i know that. There, there 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 is an agenda there, there, there has been an agenda for something that's actually mainly i find driven by liberal female academics who are heterosexual yeah exactly but, um to kind of pink wash everything that the, the overriding religious objective of society these days is to combat homophobia that you know that that is that it that is it that the idea that kids and particularly because when you're a kid um the idea of boys kissing boys or girls kissing girls is kind of funny and giggly and you talk about it, you laugh about it and i think there's an agenda to kind of drum that out because that's where homophobia starts and and you know we're going to teach kids that everything is normal and everything is equally valid and everything is natural and therefore we're going to go into detail and you might hold hands with this girl or you I'm not even going to say it. You might engage in something, you know, uh, completely on the far end of the scale, and that's all exactly the same, and that's fine. Um, and I think that's the agenda to to kind of normalize every sexual extreme so that kids can't be shocked into into being bigoted against anybody. But actually, you're shocking them out of their innocence, and you're shocking them out of their ability. I think to discover these things for themselves. Anyway, I, I, I mean, I, I think that that's I I, th I I think that what you're do what you're what you're doing there though is finding you know, the, the, the kindest potential 
explanation. The kindest explanation is that some uh, there's an agenda which is, you know, obviously misplaced, but it's to kind of, you know, and I don't think we live in a particularly homophobic country anymore at all, but that's a co- mm. another conversation. Um, but I think you're, what you're find, finding there is the kindest explanation, which is that so, uh, the agenda is to combat homophobia in later life. We're willing to compromise the innocence of an entire generation of school children, right? And I think that that's the kindest explanation, that we're weighing it all up. We don't want homophobia in twenty in fifteen years. We want to be become less and less homophobic as a country. So we're going to do this to combat that. I think that's the kindest explanation, and I'm not sure it it is like it is correct. I think there is an element of this which is sinister. I mean, I like I just I can't unsee it, and I think it's creepy and weird and paedophilic to teach children stuff like this. And that's you know, I'm not. Like, I, I don't think that a woman, if you, to use your point, like a female, like heterosexual liberal is so naive and so consumed with her own woke superior, moral superiority, that she is blind to the fact that she's exposing children to over overt sexual material just for some other agenda. I don't think anybody's blind to that. And I think that there's a weird, creepy element to this. That. There was a line. There was a line in the recording we published there. I don't know whether you've gotten to listen to it yet. I know you're working today. Um, there was a line in the recording we published where, where where one of the people on the course says to the teacher. The teacher says, "You know, I was I was talking to them about all these sexual practices, and they were really interested in fisting and rimming specifically were the two were mentioned." And the, and the the course facilitator says, "Oh, it's great! It's great that they wanted to get that dirty with you." And I just thought to myself, like, I, I can give you the benefit of the doubt, but what what a phrase! Like, what a thing to say. Like, what a thing to say. What what, what word to use about young children. I mean, okay, not young children. I want to overrate the point. These kids weren't eight, but well, they were teenagers. <laughs> what a word to use about teenagers. That, that and they great, weren't 18. They weren't 18. No. no. You know what I mean? Like, they're, 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 they're teenagers, younger. Fif- like, so well, we, The truth is we don't 14, know, we don't know what... Yeah, which reason we yeah, don't well, know exactly yeah. what class this was, but like, let's the, the oldest they could have been is sixty. Um, let's put it that way. Um, I just thought it was a ph- phenomenally weird phrase to use. Anyway, look, we'll move on because the doll did two other things this week. Uh, it passed the hate crime bill, so that's good news. You're a barrister. That's more prose- more, more prosecutions for you. Yeah. Maybe diluted, after my last comments, um, I could be I could be being prosecuted. The diluted hate speech bill. At least it didn't have some things in it, but yeah, it did. And um, arrogant as ever, you know. And they kept some of the they kept some of the gender uh, definition stuff, which is anybody who listens to this podcast knows is a particularly um, particular bugbear of mine. So um, you th- still theoretically could be prosecuted for misgendering someone. So you know, all you ladies who listen from prison when you wake up tomorrow, don't call that man in your cell a man because. He might be able to sue you before he threatens to rape you. We didn't talk about that. Let's talk about that. Mm. Let's talk about that in the context of the hate speech. I mean, first of all, I think you and I should get new pronouns. Special podcast pronouns. I can be, I don't know, awesome <laughs> gender. You can be, I don't know. Uh, I, no, I, I just want to be... I, 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 like I, to, I, 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 I foot in it if I sign your agenda, so I, I won't do it. No, I, I mean, if we're just going to pick things, completely pluck things out of the air that aren't true, I'd like from now on, from henceforth, I'd like to be 23. Okay? Because I can be 23 you, as much as you can be a woman. So I'm 23 now. Okay? You mean you're not? Oh. <laughs> uh. oh. All right, let's talk about Barbie. Um, Because Barbie Kardashian so, is... is uh, sorry, just Sarah, for the people who don't know, I know I talk, I talk so much. Why don't you talk more? Barbie Kardashian on trial in Limerick for threatening to rape. Barbie Kardashian so, is a Miss man. Barbie Kardashian. No. That's not what the law says. I'm not, Go ahead. You, take it away. Uh, I don't care. I'm not doing that. Barbie Kardashian is a man who um, is uh, in a women's prison and is currently, um, uh, according to the papers, um, uh in court for threatening to rape a fellow fellow female prisoner until she could so hard she could not would never be able to have children or could no longer have children and um anyway that won't get into state the specifics for the record. of that case 
We just have to state for the record that Barbie Kardashian is innocent of this charge until proven guilty. However, we can quote what's been said, the evidence has been brought into court thus far, so so feel free. And and has been printed into the put into the public domain. Um mm-hmm. anyway, it's not really about that. What it's really about is that when people like me have talked and argued and like put our head above the parapet, as they say, on the gender stuff and talked about the dangers to women losing their spaces, lo- you know, women in changing rooms, women in prisons and talked about these things. We were ridiculed and told it was completely absurd that there would be, you know, any kind of issue. And here we are in living colour, threats to rape, a woman who's in prison is being thre- is is being subjected to a threat of rape by a male who is in that prison with her because everybody's afraid to say that the emperor has new clothes, no clothes. Everybody's afraid to say the emperor has a penis, basically. And it's just garbage. It's just garbage. Like, it's just such garbage. And years from now, the, you know, the, the, the one thing I just really think about all the time is that I want my kids to be able to watch back this podcast because there'll be evidence that I just didn't go along with this garbage and it's misogynistic at its heart it's bad for women it's wrong 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 for a man a biological man to be in prison it, this is a person who is making a mockery and 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 women deserve in prison in chain rooms their own spaces and it's just it's just wrong. It's wrong on so many levels and everybody just goes along with it. I just can't understand it. And and here we are in Living Colour, an example of what can happen. And there is an entire class of people in the Church of Woke in Ireland who are willing to sacrifice women in the name of this agenda. And I'm not. I think it's garbage. Mm-hmm. Absolute garbage. And I just offend. it offends me that pe- there are people out there who would just allow this to go on and they don't give they you know the national women's council of ireland and all these kind of things they obviously don't give a shit about women they don't care they go to bed at night and they tuck themselves in and they tell themselves how wonderful and caring and kind they all are and then no one spares a thought for the poor woman who's in prison somewhere who's having to be subjected to these kind of threats well you're talking about the national middle you're talking about the national middle class women's liberal the national middle class liberal women's Mm -hmm. council um, yeah, your favorite yeah, organization yeah. in the world, which is it actually has a man on its board, doesn't it? Has a biological male person on its board who also um, claims to be a woman. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a strange time. So you, do you consider yourself a turf? Because I was in London at the weekend and I was, I was chatting to loads of turfs. Turfs are great fun. Yeah, um, oh. it's funny because I never. So turf for people who don't know stands for trans exclusionary radical feminist, and so. I'm definitely trans exclude. Like I never would have considered myself to be a feminist before. Yeah, you're certainly like me. not you're a radical a one. I'm a t- um, Yeah, and 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 I've said this on the podca- podcast before. Like I also I really don't like any kind of cruelty. So you know, if somebody who wants to has gender dysphoria and they want to you know identify as another gender, I will like. I object to being legally obliged to call them anything, but I'll call them whatever they want. And I'm not interested in being mean or cruel, you know, children of God and all of that. But I don't think that, like, I think it's gone completely insane. I, and and I consider myself to be a, a turf probably, but I'm absolutely with every fiber of my being. And I, you know, I, I didn't think I would have to say this, um, but I do utterly opposed to a man being allowed into the changing room with me or my daughter. End of story. But your own husband wouldn't enter the changing room with you and your daughter. That's the thing. Like He, he almost certainly wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, I, there are no circumstances. I'm a happily married man. Would I Would I enter the, cha- the, the women's changing room with just my wife? If it's a woman's changing room, says women's off. Wouldn't do it. So the, the sheer brass neck or indeed balls it takes to 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 decide you know well I, you know i i gotta wander in there because i'm just as female as these people when did we stop calling a, mental illness what it is but it's also such an arrogance because what we're told is well trans women uh trans women you know, don't feel safe in the men's changing room because there's men in there. So the what I object so strongly to is that all of a sudden as a woman, how I feel and how 
uh, my perception of my own safety is now secondary to the perception or feelings of a man. And so if that maybe, maybe, you know, maybe that does make me a feminist, like maybe we've come full circle, but men in women's changing room, men in women's sports and men in women's prison. No, no, no. I'm sorry. You can, you, you can have your feelings and you can be treated with respect like everybody else. Like I said, children of God, somebody's child, I will not be cruel to anybody, but you're not coming into the changing room and it exposes women to bad actors. You know, self ID has changed in Ireland. You can just, you're just saying your gender now it allows you the legal ability, the ability to be whatever you want to be. And there are bad actors in there and you're exposing women and you're just seems like there's a lot of people out there who are so pro trans they're willing to sacrifice women at the altar of their ideology and I'm just not here for it and no 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 and if my children are watching this podcast I'll be I'm I'm very certain that in the future lots of people will pretend that they weren't really on board with this when I won't be one of them I'll have evidence I wasn't I don't mm. I object I object in the strongest of terms well, I think you're very ungrateful there's Finnegan giving you like <laughs> A couple of hundred quid's worth of child benefit. And what else are they giving you now? Um, you get a bit of a tax cut and, uh, and and sure, like, you know, I'll be grand. And there's you, like, basically saying that you don't want to vote for them just because of some lad with a cock in your changing room. Yeah, well, John, Terrible. don't be so lazy. You know what I mean? You could just self-ID as a woman, get a uterus implanted and have a kid yourself and get the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's true. That is true. All righty. Um, Let's do what we didn't talk last week. Uh, was there anything else? Was there something else before we were sort of going on? Because I don't want to say we're going to talk about something and then not talk about it. Oh, yes. Um, before we move on to matters stateside, uh, TDs are getting maternity leave or indeed paternity leave or presumably I could become a TD and change my gender and get maternity leave. Isn't this just absolute horseshit? Like, since when do they need maternity leave? I mean, it's literally a job where you can get elected and not show up for five years and still get paid, as Sinn Féin MPs in Northern Ireland prove every day of the week. Yeah, I'm not, I, I mean, I don't think, I do, well, you are wrong, but uh, I don't okay. think that it's a, I don't think it's a practical job for, if you're actually serious about it and you plan on getting re-elected, you're never going to be able to just completely down tools and, mm. um and, you know, n never go to anything, never be seen for a year, you know, like that's probably unlikely. But I do think that, you know, and again, it's one of one of these things that like it's long overdue. I think that there, that, you know, the idea that there's some formal structure within the houses of the Oireachtas that you would have, for example, and just to, just to explain it to people, you know, like if you're not able to show up for a vote, you get a pair. Um, and, you know, pairing has been done for people who had long term illnesses and, you know, arrangements are made within parties. Mm. So, you know, Sinn Féin would offer a pair to a Fianna Gaelor so that it would cancel them not being out or whatever. So I think it's long overdue that there's some kind of formal structure to allow for that kind of um um system to 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 allow for, you know, long term as in maternity leave. Um so, yeah, I mean, I think they, they should have done it a long time ago. And it's it's, you know, a good thing. I don't think that um, the concern about maternity leave is or paternity leave is something that's stopping people from going into politics or anything. But if you're there and you want to have a family or whatever, like, I think fine. It's not a family friendly uh, job as it is. So like some kind of tokenistic structure around it is probably not a bad idea. I mean, I, I just think it's agree. bullshit. I think it's absolute bullshit. Why? And I know there'll probably be women listening to this who, who, um, who, who, who will be annoyed at me for saying so, but I'll tell you why. Because if, if one of my, colleagues at Gripped Media goes on maternity leave, which they're more than entitled to do. Um, I get money from the state and I hire a replacement in for six months. If, you get, if you're a teacher and you go on maternity leave, you can be replaced, bring in a teacher um, to teach that class for normally the whole school year or whatever until the, the person who's on maternity leave comes back. You can't replace a sitting TD. You can't go, um, we elected, you know, Josephine Soap. She's having a baby now, so we're going to put her to one side and bring in a whole different TD to represent the people who she was elected to represent. That can't be done. That would be anti-democratic. It is also the case yeah. that unlike a teacher, unlike a reporter for Grip Media, unlike somebody working in a factory, TDs don't actually have to go to work. They don't actually have to. There is no penalty. You will be paid your salary. You will, you will get all the money if you, if you never, if you miss all the votes. Okay. Fine Gael might kick you out of Fine Gael. Sinn Fein might kick you out of Sinn Fein. You'll still be a TD. You'll still be an elected representative, still entitled to your full salary, even if you never show up for a single day. Um, and the third point is that um, this is ultimately a matter, it, it, I, I feel like it's kind of guilting the voters. 
that you're kind of like saying to the voters, oh, well, I'm on maternity leave now, so I won't be doing anything for you, even though you elected me. Tough titties. I mean, fair enough on one respect. I think the voters will understand it, but the voters should understand that anyway. Um, and if the voters decide that we're not re-electing you because you haven't been around for the ninth, ninth, the, the ninth nine months or a year and a half, whatever it is, well, that's part of the job. Voters elect you. It's a very different job to any other job. And pretending that you can just stop doing it um, because you get pregnant just doesn't practically work. It's it's a classic virtue signal. I don't see how a, a, a TD can actually be replaced while they're on maternity leave, which is why I think it's utter nonsense. There you go. I, I've offended the gays and the feminists the propos- in one show. <laughs> I don't think the proposal is to replace them. I think it's just to provide a structure around them being off work. And like no TD that I've ever met is going to go, okay, I'm not coming in now for nine months or a year or whatever. But I think that, yeah, look, like there's an element of tokenism to it. But I think that when you're, you know, like barristers, there's no maternity leave for barristers, you know, like barristers Mm -hmm. are self-employed. Barristers just have to figure it out and, you know, say no to briefs or say no to work for a while and then, you know, try and make it up or whatever. Like lots of jobs aren't compatible. But I still think that uh, like as a, as a, kind of a as a state as as the government there should be something there but i'm not sure how it will work in practice um because as i said you're a fool if you just turn your phone off for a year if you really want to get Mm -hmm. elected so how it will work i don't know but uh, you know tokenistic but i think that's what that's i think that's what really annoys me sarah it's because it's it's because what you just said there i mean we don't know how it'll work in practice if they just want to put some structure in place it's it's a virtue signal it's a virtue signal that's what it is it's a kind of thing it, it's a, a law to say we're good people. So what you're suggesting is that it was a virtue signal that I actually fell for. Is that what you're saying? I think, yeah. I think you got virtue signals <laughs> good and hard. Let's talk about you. you I... Let's talk about me. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know. Maybe you're right, but I just, you know, I just self-employed i've well, like i've had three children so i know how kind of anxiety inducing it is to have a baby and worry about like what you know kind of work you are or aren't doing during your maternity leave and i have lots of friends so i i kind of have that in my in my mind but you might be right yeah. let's be clear i wasn't saying here by the way that pregnant female tds should be chained to the doll and like made vote all the time or anything like that i'm just saying they're getting paid anyway. They're not actually. They're better off than women who are pregnant in normal jobs because normally, if you go on maternity leave, you're taking some reduction in your pay, right? Or you're getting state mm. benefits to make up from reductions. Yeah, pregnant TDs get their full pay regardless of whether they're not whether they're doing the job or not. So they're actually better off as it stands without maternity leave than politicians than the people in other jobs who 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 get it. Um, so yeah, you got virtue signal proper. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, <laughs> um, let's move on. Talk about Donald Trump. Uh, he's going to win, isn't he? Yeah. Um, like, I thought he was going to win for a while, but I think that he's got the big mo now. And I think that what I said at the start, she's just content, consistently being exposed for not being a high quality candidate. Um, I don't know if you watched, was it Anderson Cooper last night? She did an interview with her. And some of her answers to the questions were just nonsense Hmm. rambling rambling nonsense and I think that she just hasn't captured um, the imagination as a candidate and it damages her ultimately it damages her and I didn't really think about this very much at the time but if you're her, her incumbency as vice president damages her because if you're upset or, or or not happy with the way America is being run right now, she can't really say anything because she's there. Yeah. That's um, and so I think I, I, I think that that's a big I think that's a big weakness that she has. And I think her performance is a big weakness. I think that she is not a good performer. Her interviews are poor. She rambles a lot. Just, I've never seen a politician who can talk for so long without giving any answer about anything. And um yeah, I think she's very weak. And I think that he is kind of the McDonald's thing the other day was kind of classic Donald Trump, but it lands well with certain people. And uh, yeah, I, I like I know lots of people who listen to this podcast like him. Lots of people don't like him. Um, I think he's going to win regardless of who likes him or not. 
I can't abide the fucking hero worship. I can't abide it. I'm sorry. He shows up and does the McDonald's thing. Good stunt, Grant. All the people going, this is the most amazing thing in the history of the world. If she had done the exact same thing, which she didn't, should have, didn't, had she done it, those same people would be going, what a cynical stunt. She was never in a McDonald's in her life. She grew up privileged. Like She would get shat on by those people for doing the exact same thing. I cannot stand, and this election has kind of made, woken me up to the nonsensical reflexive partisanship on the right. Um, because uh, everything everything you just said about her being terrible is all true. She's a terrible candidate. Um, she couldn't be worse. And then here we have a guy over on the other side who literally last week proposed exempting firefighters from tax to win some votes. That's what he said. <laughs> well, I don't think firefighters should pay any tax. I mean, give me a fucking break. Like, is that what we're is that what we're for now on this side? Just buy the election, just to, oh, yeah, well, whatever. And we have to save the country, so like we can make promises. Which he knows, you know. If you're watching this podcast, you're not a stupid person. You're not a stupid person. You know full well he can't deliver that. You know full well he's no intention to deliver. So you, you, you know full well he's actively lying to the electorate when he says, "I won't have tax on tips. I won't tax this group." Um, I'll do. It. He's actively lying to the electorate, and you're sitting there going, "Yeah, Donald, that's brilliant." I mean, have some self respect. You know, support him if you wish. Be the kind of guy who goes, you know, I think Donald Trump on balance is better. But don't give me this hero worship bullshit. Don't do it. Like, he is the same cretin he has always been. Um, and he will deliver the same cretinous four years that he delivered the last time with no delivery on anything except a few lucky hits on judges because somebody else picked them for him. Um, so, yeah, I get really annoyed. You might, have to, you might have noticed I get really annoyed, Sarah. And some of the listeners will get really annoyed back at me, and I don't care because I'll tell you the truth about what I think. And when you agree with me, great. And when you don't, fine. But anyway, end round. Well, you're allowed to have, you're allowed to have your opinion. On, like people do get upset with you, but nothing you've said is technically true. I mean, I think that the McDonald's thing. I don't really agree. I mean, I think that the McDonald's thing was because she had said she worked there, and it seems that that was not the case. Right. And he was kind of doing a stunt that made her that was showing her up, which is this classic kind of style. But I don't think it was the best stunt that ever happened. I think it was just another Donald Trump, Donald Trump stunt, which is kind of silly, but kind of, bore, you know, mildly amusing. Yeah. I mean, he has I say what tells me he's going to win is that he's having fun on the campaign trail in a way that he wasn't in 2020. In 2020, yeah. he was this kind of angry, ranty candidate the whole time. Now, he still does angry, ranty stuff a lot. It's just that that's not what goes on Twitter. But the fun stuff, he's having more fun with it. And he's kind of gotten back to that 2016 vibe. Um, but I do wonder, you know, I, I, I will believe a Donald Trump victory when I see it. I will. Because um, I just think there's a, there's a, there's a, there is a bubble um, on the right that is developing around the idea that he's definitely going to win and the polls are wrong four years ago so the polls are wrong this year and they haven't been corrected um, and yet there's still a massive democratic turnout machine in the swing states um, he is he's actually gaining votes with blacks and hispanics that's true but if you look at the polls he's also losing votes from I guess you'd say people like me right people who are registered republicans white middle class americans who've had it with him and they're like, you know, I, I take four years of her over four years of him. Um, and I think she, there was a poll last week that put her on something like 11% of Republicans. That's not an insignificant vote. Now, maybe it's in the yeah. wrong places. Maybe it's in places like New York and California. But, um, yeah, I think it's, I, I think if you're, if you're, it's, it's not time to pop the short champagne corks on a Trump victory yet. But we'll Oh, def definitely not. Um, and I agree with you that the polls, you know, there's definitely a kind of a, a lot of people on the right kind of wishful thinking and they're seeing the polls and they're correcting them with half hope and half, you know, kind of assumptions that may or may not be wrong. But it's not the polls necessarily for me. It's just the feeling. It's like mm. you say that he's having fun that, you know, you, you when you watch like there's there's panic that, you know, there's this Democratic, you know, as you would have said to me before, like the traditional Democratic panic of November. Um uh, every presidential election and her performances are consistently I think disimproving and she's starting to feel a bit panicked herself she doesn't look like she's having a good time so I'm basing the fact that I think he might win on nothing more than my own kind of you know temperature gauge from you know kind of funny like little things like you know people I would follow on Instagram who are quite liberal or you know, in America and kind of changing their vote and giving an explanation. I think that there, I've noticed a kind of a story emerging around people, 
you know, voting for Trump, which is some something around, you know, I'm not happy with the way things are and she's there already. And, you know, I don't really like him, but, you know, like just, I, I just mm. noticed things kind of formulating around a kind of a narrative of a reluctant, in some cases, and two people spring to mind that I'm friends with from the States who are extremely liberal and who wouldn't have voted for Donald Trump in the past and who are kind of formulating a, 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 a vote around Donald Trump despite not liking him. And that's mm. new. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across a woman uh, called Bridget Fetisi, have you? No, I don't think so. She's a writer, a writer for um, The American Spectator. And um, she kind of she's a, fits the mold of your friend. She's former liberal. She um, kind of had a very libertine youth. She's now a soccer mom in Texas. And mm. um, she wrote a piece during the week basically kind of going, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. Um, I don't like Harris. I don't like Trump. But all my friends are kind of in the WhatsApp groups. They're starting to lean Trump because they feel that the, it's a simple equation that his four years economically were better than, than the Biden four yeah. years. Um, yeah. And if, that, if that's what it comes down to, that's what it comes down to. And I don't think Texas obviously isn't going to be a determinative state. They probably haven't seen yeah. any ads, so on, so forth. So they're going off yeah. vibes. But I, I agree with you. And I'm not disputing the vibes at this point are drifting heavily in his favor but then again how much can you trust vibes it's hard to know we'll find out in two weeks what what bothers me about all of this though is the kind of um the feel that the feeling that i have because i got burnt the last time that this is this is this is all part of the same psychological movement i saw tucker carlson basically the other day saying look if trump doesn't win it's rigged but i'm sorry that's that bullshit like the polls are tight oh, as a i tick. hate that stuff you know, yeah, uh, but I, I see. I'm seeing so much of it. You know, the polls are tight as a tick. The the betting odds are like 54, 46 in his favor. Okay, slight advantage. Forty six percent wins. Forty six percent of the time, which is a lot of the time. Um, you know, I, and this kind of psychological preparation that is clearly going on on the right for kind of like either he wins or it was rigged. That makes me really uncomfortable. I'm sorry, it does yeah. because if yeah. if if you can never lose, then you can never learn. Um, and it, we'll just do this again in four years. Yeah. Well, Trump 28, man. Stop. Stop. I mean, that's the other thing. I, uh, as we said last week, it's not just, I just want it to be over because I'm bored of it. Just make it end. The idea that Trump would lose and then come back again, I, I can't be dealing with that. Uh, isn't it a to, pleasure? It has to end sometime. It has to end sometime. Isn't it a pleasure in one sense to live in a country where a general election will happen five weeks from now and it hasn't even been called yet? With these Americans have been suffering through this shit for yeah, yeah a year and yeah. a half. Yeah, I was watching yeah. um two weeks ago. I was watching my beloved New York Jets, whose season is collapsing as it always does. Every year, New York Jets play American football for a couple of games, and then their season collapses, and we all cry about it. But I was watching one of their games, and literally during the ad break, it was just wall to wall. I was taking an American stream uh, through DAZN, and it was just wall to wall. Trump Harris, Trump Harris, Trump Harris. By the end of it, you're like, I hate both of you. I don't know how voters. Are, I don't know how voters don't yeah. just hate both of them. Well, this is it. So. I mean, we're saying that we're bored of the conversation about the general election being called because it feels like it's too long of a lead in. They basically spent like you know thirty five percent of their lives in an election cycle. <laughs> Pandatas, isn't it? All right, uh, we will leave it there. I think. Have you anything to add, Sarah, uh, to our viewers before you go? You'll be popular this week now. The Trump fans are. I can. I can feel the keyboards underneath. They're heating up the comments. Going. Nah, nah, nah. You know, you've trumped arrangement syndrome. I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to feel. I'm starting to be a little bit deranged. I'll admit it, because um, I just don't get it, and I don't think I ever will get it. So I'm sorry. We'll, we'll agree on other things. Um, but uh, have you anything to add? No, no, you don't have Trump derangement syndrome. But um, you know, people are going to get upset regardless, John. So we're just going to be you this week, I think. If I go cuckoo, you know, you're going to have to find a new podcast co-host. If I go like properly demented, <laughs> if I end up in a Trump derangement asylum somewhere, go going no, but well, these are. I don't think it's going to be. I don't think Barbie Kardashian will be applying for the job. No, no. Um, who knows? Maybe you could get somebody to pull your hair. I, I, I mean that that was, that was a really bad joke. I was trying to refer back to the whole sister thing. You know, your sister, your sister, would be excellent on this podcast with you, actually. <laughs> You could fight. You could be one of those political <laughs> figures that have a fight. Yeah, that's not unheard of. Um, yeah. Anyway, I prefer if you just stick around because um, you know it's just easier that way, John. 
It is. All right, listen, thanks for putting up with us. Literally, this case, uh, this week, maybe you put up with us, um, but thank you for listening for, to us, as always. Uh, we will be back. I will be in Malta next week, so instead of the bookcase behind me, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, I'm hoping there'll be a wonderful view of the Letter Harbour, but probably just be the inside of a hotel room, so we'll see. Um, we'll be back next week, and then thereafter, uh, taking you right through the general election and beyond. I've been John, she's been Sarah. Thanks for watching. This was the week that really was. Take care. <laughs>